There's power in the name of Jesus. I praise his name. The name of Jesus has the power to break every chain, to set, set the captives free. And Lord God, that's what we're here for. We're praying that, Lord God, that the power that we know is there in the name of Jesus will bring others to know you as their Lord and Savior. So I pray, Lord God, in, in the th words that I spoke earlier about hearing from you and what your will is and your desire for uh, each individual and collective body that we are here, Lord, that somehow, some way we can reach the souls that are lost that do not know you, that we can bring them into your kingdom, help bring them into your kingdom to give them the encouragement, to let them know that you love them so much. Help us, Lord God, to have softened hearts and a tender spirit that we can discern and understand exactly what you have for us to do to help reach the people of this community and surrounding areas, Lord. I just ask that you would uh, open our eyes, open our hearts, open our minds to what you have. Lord God, we are not putting you in a box. We do not want to put you in a box ever. Lord God, we want to follow you outside the box. We want to do what your will is, wherever you take us and whatever it is that you want us to do, Lord. That's what our desire is. Father God, I pray for these requests. I pray for each and every one of them, Lord God, that uh, you would move in their lives. And Lord God, where, where they need, if they need you, I pray, Lord God, that they would know, come to know you as their Lord and Savior. Where, where healing needs to take place in their body, I think about little hope, Lord God, uh, Lori, and others that are here, Lord God, that we have asked prayer for, uh, Lord God, that you would touch them. Lord God, for the mental part of it, Lord God, whatever it is in, in people's lives that they need, even the ones that are unspoken, Lord, that have not been spoken today, and there's several I know that are here, but I pray, Lord God, that you would move in their lives and uh, you would touch each and every one of them. Father, be with us as we go start our praise and worship, Lord God. I would pray that it would be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear, that you would be lifted up, that you would be honored, and all glory would come to you, Lord God. We love you, Lord God, and we just ask that you continue to be with us and, and at this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand to worship God. He's earned it. You've been to Jesus for the cleansing power. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace itself? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are you garments? Are they white as snow? Are you white? 
I'm forgiven Cause you were forsaken I'm accepted You were condemned I'm alive and well Your spirit is within me Because you died and rose again I'm forgiven
Scripture is so adamantly clear on this that the angels and all of heaven rejoices when someone enters into the kingdom of God. That is nothing short of a miracle. I mean, it should be like we should be doing the icky shuffle or we should be doing a dance like, we, like God just scored a touchdown. All right? Seriously, another soul is saved. And now our job is to go ahead and pray for that soul to be sanctified, to be delivered of all the things that burden that person, that they can go ahead and have a life that is known and free and full of the Holy Spirit. This is no joke. This is serious. And we get to witness it. We get to be a part of it. And part of that is because the church is able to do these things because this is why, where our tithes and offerings go. They go to God's glory. That souls are being saved because of our faithfulness in our giving. Don't think that you're just writing a check or dropping a coin or whatever it is. This is serious. This is eternally serious stuff. So let's take it so. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise and worship you and we rejoice with all of heaven that a soul has been saved. Bring it. Move in us. Open up the floodgates of heaven and let your spirit pour down upon Layton uh, through us, your people, your body. Unleash your spirit within us that we may go ahead and praise and prayer and we may go ahead and bear witness to your love, your glory, your grace and the freedom that we have in you because you have set us free. So Lord, receive these gifts and offerings that we offer you to your glory. You have heard our prayers. We've been asking you to multiply them, and you are. Lord, we desire to radically change this community, but we will not do it without you. Just as Moses said, I will not go any further without you. So we will not go into the community unless you lead us, and you are doing so. Show us your will. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Grace and peace upon you, church family. Good morning. You know what? Uh, we got a board meeting this week, and I think I'm going to go ahead and request the board put seatbelts in the pews because God is taking us on a ride. So better buckle up. The, uh, I got to tell you, yesterday was amazing. In all my ministry life, I have never seen a back-to-school event, and I've been to oh, more than I can count. Um, I need an extra set of toes. Uh, and that is the best one I've ever seen. I honestly thought that this was an annual event that has been going on for decades. It's like, that was amazing to see God work through the church. And, and Beatrice, oh, she took off already. The, hey, if you missed it when you didn't see those kids, go ahead and worship God. And I am going to be talking to her that we could be blessed to have our children minister to us through dance and song. Um, and the, um, <clears throat> and, and lastly, I just, I want to thank everybody that volunteered and served. It was, that was, it, it was a long day and uh, you made a difference in the kingdom of God, obviously. I mean, I knew that God was touching souls. I didn't, had no idea that people were going to come to know him. And, um, and because of you, even more are. Uh, regarding baptisms, uh, I'm getting a dunk tank and the kids are going to throw balls. <laughs> in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you're going in. So <laughs> that was just lighthearted fun. Hopefully it didn't offend anybody. The, uh, and this, it's a reminder on the prayer and praises. Uh, if you would like them posted online and you need help doing so, uh, we have a prayer box out there. Thank you for those that have put it in. I upload them up during the middle of the week, and there's a box that's marked private if you don't, and I adamantly pray for you all the time, and that is be kept between you, me, and Christ, okay? Uh, another note. All right, so Shelly's not here. She's feeling amazing, and so is Nick, and <clears throat> I was praying and thinking this morning, and and I told her, I go, you know what? You're going to stay home. I got an assignment for you. So she is critiquing our service right now online. Like, yeah, we're being judged. Okay. <laughs> and what she's doing is I asked her to go ahead and start taking notes on our online presence that, uh, so we can go ahead and see where areas of growth are, where, where our strengths are, and so that we can go ahead and take those that can't make it in due to illness or travel or whatever it is that we can best glorify god so this is a good thing and obviously you've met shelly she's super super sweet um and so uh with that let's go to god as his people love man we're on it this morning god is moving heavenly father we we just we come to you you are the god of us and you are the god of this community in fact you are the god of the world even when they don't know you Lord, continue to just speak to us boldly in a voice that, that we can hear because sometimes our ears are full of cotton. Break through that. Break through our monotony. Break through the chaos. Break through our distress. Remind us to call out to you in times of brokenness and in times of joy and in times in the middle because all of us are somewhere in there. But we are in you, and you are in us, and for that we praise you. Lord, remind us frequently and often that you created us on purpose and for your purpose. And forgive us for not living out your word, and help us to forgive those that misrepresent your word. Lord, we have unspoken prayers this morning. I can just feel it. The souls are crying out to you, and we just don't know the words to say. Give us those words, Holy Spirit. You know them. Jesus, you're our advocate, and we trust you, and we thank you that you are there in our presence. Lord, radically move us. Shake us to the very core of our existence that we would become desperate. Lord, I lift up Leighton Hanford, Church of the Nazarene, that you would break us to become desperate for you. And that's a hard prayer because you answer those prayers. And we will become the people of your design and not of ours. Lord, shape us, change us, mold us, do whatever it is, break us down, rebuild us because you created us. And we're coming to you, kneeling in praise and worship with open arms, open hearts, open eyes, open ears. 
to worship you. Lord, we love you. And we ask that you continue to give our leaders wisdom and, and mercy and justice. And Lord, our world, it's just there was a lot of catastrophes happening this week. And you heard the conversation Shelly and I were having. And Lord, we just keep our eyes fixed on you and not on the chaos that surrounds us. So we renounce any evil. And Lord, we look to your goodness. And we ask and we praise and we give praises and prayers and we come to you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. <clears throat> hey, when I was a kid, all right, and I'm not that young, so I'm sure that some of us can remember that. Remember when you went and you wanted to buy some furniture and like you went with your parents or you were the parent and uh, you went and bought a bookshelf or a cabinet or a desk or a dresser or a random piece of furniture, and you would just go to the furniture store, and you'd walk around, and, and I remember going ahead and picking out stuff, and my parents, or they would pick out stuff, and, and then it would be delivered to the house, or we'd borrow a pickup truck, and we'd load it up into the pickup truck, and then it was nice and easy, and the delivery was almost always free. You didn't have to pay the extra Amazon Prime charges. And, um, but as I grew up, uh, there's a trend that started to happen in our world. And it, it, it came from Sweden, of all places. I mean, you, we were taught to trust the Swedes, right? No. I'm sorry, Sweden. You drastically changed the culture of America. Um, we have assemble your own furniture now. You don't go ahead and go to purchase a piece of furniture that's already built and made and crafted. No. It gets brought in a box. And it, but it does come to your doorstep sometimes if you want to go ahead and have it delivered. Um, you can go ahead and fit it in your, in your truck or you can tie it on top of your roof. And, and there's usually like 100,000 pieces in it and there's always a note on every box, some assembly required. <laughs> to say modestly. And so if you want to have a bookshelf or a cabinet or a desk or a dresser or any other random piece of furniture, you still go to the store or you still shop online. And whether it's, you know, Costco, Kmart, Ikea, um, Walmart, and, uh, and you end up getting it in your house. And it usually weighs like half a million pounds. And even on the box, it says, do not lift alone, use 10 people. <clears throat> And so you get it in there, and then all of a sudden there's this anxiety, right? Because you're trying to first, you got to open the box. And those things, they have like super Gorilla Glue on them with 10,000 staples. And, um, and, and when that anxiety goes up, we begin to forget the bigger picture. And it's so easy to get lost in the details. And hopefully not, but the, the first couple times that I, I tried to put a dresser together, I got lost. Um, I couldn't even see the forest through the trees. And so, um, and it takes practice to be able to be comfortable with having 5 million pieces in front of you and some of those things I had never seen before and where do they go and how do you assemble this? And it's, it was all over the place. But what I learned over time and prayer, thank you, Lord. <laughs> Seriously, I would pray before I opened a box. Lord, Help. Um, that the most effective way to assemble this uh, put together pieces of furniture is to actually follow the directions. And I am the, um, what do you call it, stereotype of a man who will not follow directions. If you tell me to go left, I will go right just to prove you wrong. I, I, I make my phone redirect just because I want my phone to know I'm in charge. And so, but I learned over the years, you got to follow the directions and not just glance at them and go like, yeah, 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 I got it. Okay, it's, it looks like a piano, so I'll just build a piano from that. And, and then, but I began to go ahead and I saw some goodness that was discipling and God began to use those directions in my life. And I began to go ahead and ponder what step is in front of me what step I just completed, and then two or three steps forward and where I'm going with this. And pretty soon I found out that it was kind of fun to put this together. 
Uh, I love playing with Legos. My kids just got me a fat boy Harley Davidson's about this big and 1,100 pieces. And it took me two months to put together. And now it's on the shelf right next to my other fire department memorabilia. Um, but I found out in following directions when putting together this furniture, I, be, I had to be mindful and I had to be intentional. And I began to, to ponder on these directions and, and then I began to prepare a place. And so if you want to know my trick, I would actually take everything out of the box and I would open the box up as big as it could and I would lay everything systematically on the box. And so I wouldn't lose anything. And I always developed a place and a space. And so the, the project became like a, like a fairly good time. And then the last piece is awesome because once you put it together, you set it up for use in your life. This, this thing you bought, this thing you delivered, this thing that was assembled, some assembly required, um, it had a purpose. And, and like for my dresser, the purpose was to put clothes in it. And because each piece of furniture I bought, I used for the purpose in which I needed. The desk I used for study and writing. The, like I said, the dresser, I would put my clothes in it. Uh, the bed, I would sleep on it. And then, but sometimes it's so easy to forget the purpose of, of the furniture pieces when I'm just, or the furniture when I'm just looking at a random bunch of pieces. And, and yet when everything's put together, and into practice and assembled, it becomes functional and it changes our life for the better. And this is where we're going this morning because James is reminding us not to forget the end, that not to be lost in the details, not to forget the, the, tr the, the forest or not be, not be able to see the forest through the trees by reminding who we are in Christ and where he is taking us. And it's funny, I just the last month, it's I've been preparing sermons and then we have our prayer and praise time and it's like spot on to exactly and I do not talk to Tom about what's going on. And that is the Holy Spirit working through his people right here, right now. And please don't take that for granted. Um, it, but going ahead and practicing and, and learning how to do this assembly and putting it into our lives and and who we are in Christ and where he is taking us, this takes practice through hearing and receiving and practicing and practicing, practicing, living out the word of God. So if you are able, would you please stand for the reading of God's word, James chapter one. Can you believe we're still in chapter one? <clears throat> 19 through 27. You must understand this, my beloved, your God's beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness and, be, and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those that look at themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves and go on going away, immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of the liberty, and preserve, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act. They will be blessed in their doing. If any of you think you are religious and do not bridle their tongues, but oh, and do not bridle their tongues, but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before the before God the Father is this: to care for orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself unstained by the word world. This has been the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. And again, I invite you. I, I say it every single time. Please stand for the reading of God's word because this is God's holy word. And we deserve, God's word deserves respect. If Jesus came in, the word of God in flesh walked through these doors, would we all just kind of sit down and go like, well, that's cool. No, we'd be standing up, right? 
So we do so for the reading of the word. And then when I say this has been the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. You're welcome to just give God thanks. Thanks be to God. And then we sit. And that, that's just something that is part of discipling. And so <clears throat> it's good to remember the content, context of this letter by James that he sent to these first readers. James, Remember, James is writing to this dispersed, persecuted people that find themselves immersed in this new culture that, and conditions that's outside Jerusalem. It's outside the temple. It's outside Jewish tradition. And, and additionally... This letter by James is traditionally thought of as the first public um, dispersed written document on how to live and act as Christ followers. So let's consider that for a moment, okay? I think that that's worth consideration. How do we learn to be Christian and follow the life and the way of Jesus as our Savior and Lord? Has anybody ever thought about that? How do we do it? We learn from fellowshipping and sharing life with one another. By, we learn it by tradition um, and by the reading of Scripture, by teaching and by preaching of God's Word and, and the life and living the life and ministries of the church. But what happens when that way hasn't even been set yet? And what happens when you're dispersed and there's not a community of believers to dwell on and to learn from and to walk with? What happens when there's no teaching and preaching available? They didn't have the New Testament yet. It was still in the process of being written. The only thing they had was to go ahead and go to the local synagogue if they had one and re or be taught and dis discipled through the law of Moses. And these dispersed Christians are the first generation. And as such, they're, they're learning as they go, and they're, they're learning on the road, so to speak, on how to live out the teachings of Jesus as they pursue a life of holiness. To be holy as God is holy. And James reinforces the purpose of his writings to not forget and to keep moving forward that their present circumstances, as much as it's just a scattered mess that may seem, is not the end. That the end for those that love God and to let endurance have its full effect, the fullness of faith, the crown of life, maturity, wholeness, completeness, na com completeness and knacking in nothing, finding joy in hardship, and to be vessels of God's blessing. That through these circumstances in which they find themselves now, in which we find ourselves now, each one of us is in a circumstance right now they and we are not to forget who we all are and what god is calling us to be now and grow to become and that is to be holy holiness is god's love acting into the love of god and it's on the screen and if you want to write that down you should the church the body of christ the it's God's love, and we as God's love are to act into the love of God, and this means we need to put into practice the teachings of God so that we can reveal God, that he is real to the lost and hurting world, like, like we did yesterday at the school bash for the latent community. We revealed the love of God to a bunch of strangers, and by that, the Holy Spirit worked through this body to touch souls. That's real. And that takes practice. And it takes endurance. And we did it in spite of our present circumstances. And we're blessed because of that. You know, at the time this letter was written, however, these scattered new Christians had very little contact with the apostles and, and the teachings and, and struggled not to be drifting back into the community. If they were isolated. They're surrounded by different religions and and paganism and and canaanite religions and it would be really easy for them to go ahead and get frustrated in situations and and live undercover and keep from standing out in the crowd and it would be easy for them to say yes i know what god's word says and yes it's locked away in my heart and then just let it collect dust and be hidden and then be out of sight isn't quietly 
believing and confessing uh, Christ as Lord and God raised from the dead enough? Can't I just go ahead and say, Jesus, be my Savior. I believe that you died for my sins and that you rose from the dead. Isn't that enough? No. According to James, it's not. According to the writings of the Apostle Paul, it's not. According to God's word, that is not enough. According to the Old Testament prophets, no. And certainly not according to the teachings of Jesus. He lambasted the Pharisees for doing that exact thing. And there is no place for an apathetic or non-responsive faith for those that belong to the family of God. We will be known to the world. Not what we have built and hidden and hold in secret, but how we act in and outwardly in and by the love of God. Holiness is actionable. And that is what God desires for each and every one of us, to be holy as he is holy. And James starts off with this reinforcing of our place in the world, or, or better stated, our place in the kingdom of God. That we are heirs with Christ as brothers and sisters. So look over to the person next to you, and if they're a woman, say, hey, sister. If they're a man, say, hey, bro. <laughs> look at the other way, and same thing. You're all related. You got Jesus' DNA in you. <clears throat> and that's pretty cool. The, we are heirs and enjoined together in faith through the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is imperative that we grasp this in the totality of what James is stating. And the context of this, of this culture is steeped in community and family. We are family and we are a community. And James is reinforcing the teaching and through him that we are given new birth. And in other words, we are born again. And with that new birth, we have the forgiveness of sin and the restoration of, <clears throat> of a right relationship with God. And, and we're made new creations and we're adopted into, into God's very own family. And, and this family isn't a temporary family. It's, it's an eternal family. So it's, it's kind of funny because a lot of times we have a lot of infighting, right? And, and as brothers and sisters in Christ. Guess what? We're going to be together forever. So <laughs> find a resolution. The, um, and, and don't give up on each other. And, and in that, we're given, in Christ, we're given a new name and a, and a, and a way to, to take as our own, to uphold. And that name that we are given, besides the name that Jesus gives us, as it states in Revelation, we have the name of Jesus. And when we enter into the family of God, we are to act in the ways of the family of God. And this is a reaffirmation of, of who we are in Christ whenever we see in Scripture brothers and sisters. It's a reminder that, that we may not be of the same family lineage here on earth, but we are the same family lineage in eternity. And James continues, you must understand this. God's family, God's representatives are to act like this. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And the reason is that anger does not nurture or act in the love of God and can be a source of division and harm and pain and trauma because when we get angry and, and when anger becomes left unchecked, it can become weaponized and destroy all that stand in our path. In our anger, we become blind. In our anger, we say things. You can't unring that bell. And the source of the anger is almost always, in fact, I haven't seen any other situation where the source of the anger isn't rooted in anxiety and it isn't rooted in fear. And imagine the first Christians that read this letter. Their lives were surrounded with anxiety or fear. Look at the world we live in. Look at the circumstances around you. How many of us have anxiety? How many of us have fear? <clears throat> we give that left unchecked, we get angry, and all of a sudden it becomes weaponized. And it, this is the time that we take inventory and stock of our hearts and the motives of our actions. And this is the inspection that starts with which voice is loudest in our lives. The voice is... 
<clears throat> because the voice that is loudest is the voice that we are following. Is it the voice of the Lord that's, that's shown through the word of God? <clears throat> is it the still, quiet voice of the Holy Spirit that speaks to us when we're quiet and seeking and listening? Quick to listen. We're to be quick to listen and listen intently. Pull the cotton out of our ears. Or is it the voice of the world that tells us we have a right to be angry, we have a right to isolate, we have the right to, to indulge ourselves in sinful delights and lure and, turn, and the call to turn our backs on God because we have earned it. Check your motives. See, these words that James have written are endless truths. And if God's word is to make an impact in our lives, it must first exhibit a, we must first exhibit a willingness to hear it, quick to listen. And James is writing very similarly to the statement of the Apostle Paul, who later wrote to the believers in Rome, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. See, it's not enough, though, to be quick to listen. James, continuing from the, the previous verses, that we are to be quick to listen to something. Not just quick to listen, but specifically quick to listen to the word of truth, which is the word of God, which gives us new birth and gives us new life. And by hearing this life-giving word, our efforts and growth in the life and faith are to be stimulated into action. We are to live out what we hear from the word of God in our lives, both vertically and horizontally, as we mentioned last week. And our lives are to have a product. You know, when, I, when we build stuff, right, we got all these parts and, and then we're assembling it, it becomes a product. And the product of God moving in us, the product of our actions is righteousness, which is to be nurtured in our relationship with God. From a relationship with God, we are to respond horizontally every day in our daily relationships with others. And I don't know about you, but sometimes it feels like the world would be so much easier to live, if, live with if there was nobody around. I don't know if you've ever driven in traffic in L.A., <clears throat> but yeah, it'd be nice if there was a little less cars, right? But God doesn't work like that. He wants us in the midst of the traffic because when we don't get road rage, people take notice because we have somebody who's going ahead and watching out for us that we're submitted to and we're practicing his holiness and righteousness. You know, we have a natural in inclination, all of us, to be selfish, self-centered, and self-absorbed. That we want to be right, we want to be heard, and we want to take control of the circumstances around us. And honestly, none of it that is necessarily bad, but it can become harmful if we cease to pay attention to the wisdom found here in Scripture. When we are slow to listen to those around us, or quick to interject our opinion, it becomes difficult to show, not show our frustration and even anger. Uh, don't raise your hands on this one, please. But have you ever met any one of those people that always has an opinion and is willing to be the first one to give it? Okay, like I said, don't raise your hand. <laughs> the, rather, it's, <clears throat> rather than hearing the big picture and, and, and seeing the good intentions of others, they, they just they shut down their ears and they just open their mouth. Um, and it usually comes across as abrasive and critical, um, personal to the recipient of those thoughts and insights. And James is just shipped, simply sharing that as Christ followers, we can do better as we live out our faith. You know, maybe we need to think a little bit more before we speak. Maybe we need to read and follow the directions so it doesn't stay a jumbled mess. See, all of us are to be quick or quicker to listen. And the challenge is that it means that we are to be still, to have control of our emotions, to have control of our thoughts, and aware of our surroundings and who we are talking with. And when we are quick to listen, there's, there's not much more room to, to speak or interject or thrust ourselves verbally against and assault others around us. See, a continual talker isn't always external. Sometimes it's internal. It is unable to hear what everybody else is saying and even unable to hear what God is saying. 
And this is at the heart of what James means when he, when he says, blessed are the, or Jesus means when he says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be known as children of God. When we are quick to listen, it gives us room to hear and understand at the heart of others and, and where they are, and we can hear the Holy Spirit and when, we're, when we're talking to them, and we can be moved and led by God in his will. It begins us to let us see the best in others by taking the time to see their good intentions. And when that happens, we are less likely to get torqued, um, divided, and we're most likely to find a commonality of peace because we become peacemakers. And we're less likely to blow up or flip our lid. And, and we become much slower to become angry because all of us, as children of God, as members of God's family, we are to be peacemakers. And we are, when we are peacemakers, we are participating in this new life of God that gives us, through faith in Christ, the ability to apply it and doing so as his children are responding into this new mode in which God desires his family to live. But like the, uh, the assembling of this put-together furniture that we live with, uh, we need to hear the directions and then receive the directions by meditating on them. And... <clears throat> We go into verse 21 and it says, Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness uh, and become with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. See, the key word in here is often missed. And the key word is therefore. You know, I, I really like the phrase rank sordidness, but that's not the key word. It's therefore. You see, therefore is very important in Scripture. And this is just a lesson. Anytime you ever see the word therefore, Pay attention because it means that all that follows is a, directly, uh, re- is a direct response to all the previous verses attached. La, 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 therefore do this. Pay attention to the word therefore. So we are to be quick to listen, hearing the word of God, and therefore, when we're quick to listen and hearing the word of God, therefore receive the word of God by making a place of the word of God to be assembled in our lives. So remember what I was sharing about making plenty of room for those pieces of furniture that I was assemble, right? Take the cardboard, put it out, but, you know, stage one, two, three, stuff like that. The simplicity of the application of this verse is that we are to make room for God's word in our heart that is to be implanted by the Holy Spirit when we are saved. In the Old Testament, God states that there would be a time in which his law is written, written on the hearts of those that love him. And we see that in Jeremiah 31, 33, on the second half of that verse, I put my law within them and I will write on it their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And the implanted word of God is his will and his law that sets us apart. We we sing about it this morning. By applying that written word on our hearts into our lives as his family so that we become a holy people. And we, we can't forget the purpose of God to reveal his will and his love through us. There's a purpose of his, of his word. And, and like I said, we saw his word alive in flesh yesterday. Jeremiah wrote this to a people in exile. James writes this to a people in exile. And we cannot forget that all of us are a people in exile. We are ambassadors in a land that is not ours because our home, our citizenship is found in heaven alone in God's kingdom. And all of our actions are to reveal the heart of God and his kingdom. So remember, okay, therefore, therefore was the most important word. And once we have heard the word of God, we are to receive the word of God. And then what? We're to act on the word of God. And James is echoing here this this dualism that attempts, it it tempts all of us by living a non-apathetic or living an apathetic or non-responsiveness to God's word. And, And therefore, there can't be any room in our hearts for sin or moral filth that or hate that comes from unchecked anger, that comes from evil. And the hearts that love God and live out his word. Those two are incompatible. They cannot be together. If you have pure water, a million gallons of pure water, and you put one drop of bleach in it, 
Is it pure? No. Kind of common sense. I mean, I'm, like I said, you'll hear it a million times, I'm about as sharp as a wet sack of liver. But I get that. Um, the, and here, James, what James is reaffirming, what he's saying to us, is that don't be two-faced. Remember, we were talking about don't have a divided faith or, or don't have a divided soul. Don't talk out both sides of your mouth because that leads to an unstable person that has a double mind that, G, that James shares in verse 8. And James has this play on words. And I love the way he, James is a poet at heart. Uh, remember, James the Just. Don't Remember, that was his nickname. And he says, rid yourselves of. And, uh, and rid yourselves of all sin. And the context of this is, is taking off an article of clothing that is dirty, like a, a shirt or, or shoes. <coughs> In the fire department, when I first started, uh, you know our, our yellow like turnouts or, you know, er, yes. Okay. Everybody gets that. Okay. Really cool. You know, red suspenders, yellow turnout, black boots. You know, when you're 23 years old, you think you're the cat's meow. And so you go ahead and you take them off and you put them right next to your bed, just like we watch in the cartoons or shows, um, emergency, you know, back in the day and you shove them down and you set it up perfect. So you don't even have to think in the middle of the night, the tones go off. You're dead asleep. You don't even have to think. You just close your eyes, turn around, get out of bed, boom, 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 pull, and you go. Well, there was a study that was shown that the toxins and the hazardous materials produced by normal fires got impregnated into our turnouts and started causing a higher rate of cancer. Even the leather straps that for our little chin straps, men and women began getting cancer on the side of their faces and on the outside of their ears. And so in response to that, the fire departments bought us uh, washing machines for our turnouts. But they also did something very important. Remember, we're talking get rid of, right? Uh, what they did is they said, you can no longer have turnouts where you live. There's no place for pollutants and toxins that will kill you where you live. Leave it out by the rig. And so we had to change our habits. We had to change our ways. No longer did we have the ease of just having that and slipping it in mindlessly into these toxin-filled turnouts that polluted our beds, that polluted <clears throat> the, um, our lockers, that polluted the carpet, that polluted everything. They were finding asbestos in our turnout lockers. Because back in the day, that was what we did. See, James is saying the same thing. You know, just like the fire department said, get rid of those turnouts in your living quarters. So James is saying, get rid of all that sin and evil that's impregnated and trying to kill you out of your lives. It's very practical advice. And we are to rid or remove ourselves and get rid of all that is contaminates and brings potential death into our spiritual life by acting and responding. Gosh darn it, sounds like fire, uh, Christians are first responders, right? You get a call, act, respond. I just never thought of it like that. And we do so by making the word room in our hearts for the word of God. And this takes practice. We learn new habits. And James, if anything, is one of the most practical pastors I've ever read and encourages us to practice the word of God in our lives daily that would grow into the fullness and reveal the holiness of heart. And practice makes perfect. Whether we're learning a new sport or learning a new habit, all, it all takes practice. And by perfect, I don't mean that it's unblemished. I don't mean it's spotless. Practice is doing everything we can in that moment. And it may not be untainted, but we're doing the best. If a perfect pen lives into its purpose only when it can write. It can be chewed up, half broken. It can be stained. But if it can still write, it fulfills its purpose. And this is what James is talking about. When we fully surrender all we are and all we have to God, we are living in a sanctified, <clears throat> set apart, complete in the fullness of God's intention life to be holy as God is holy. You may be stained. You may be chewed up. You may be trauma. You may be broken. But when we set apart our lives for God, we live into his purpose 
perfectly in that moment. And he begins to restore us. And that is hope. Just like that little girl that we're praying for, we have hope. And this has been the heart of James and his writings to these first Christians. Practice it. Don't quit. Let endurance take its full effect. Practice produces perseverance. And practice brings maturity and allows us not to be lacking in anything. And, and don't give up. I know that it's hard and you're, and you're alone. And, and it's not easy living in the world. But don't give up. Just practice what you hear. And practice the directions. And practice putting him to our lives. And practice produces holiness and action. And this command in verse 22, James says, be doers of the word and not hearers and not only hearers. And, you know, we are to listen to the word of God. And that comes from the Bible and reading and study as well as engaging in the life and ministries of the church. And, and we are to listen and allow it to, to penetrate into our life. And it's not enough to just listen. There's an awful lot of people who know an awful lot, know, they know an awful lot about the Bible and they're experts in Hebrew and Greek and the culture of the first century and they know more about the Bible than anybody else and they know about the culture and, and that doesn't mean they're a follower of Christ. It's not enough to listen. And we'll be getting into that a little later in James. I don't want to skip ahead. It's hard not to. Um, but we must be doers of the word, doctors of the word. And when I mean doctor, that means practitioner of the word, practitioners of our faith. And we must put into practice what it says, because when it comes down to it, we have to do it. There's no way around this, folks. God is not asking for our opinion. Okay? I, t I tell my kids when they were growing up, they'd say, like, they'd interject something. I'd ask them to do something. Did they interject? I said, I'm not asking for your opinion. If I want your opinion, I'll ask for it. Okay, there's a time when God will ask you for your opinion. Doing his word is not that time. And it doesn't matter how much we sit and read the Bible or watch or listen to sermons. If we are not practicing daily what we have heard, we are not growing in our faith. And James uses this great analogy. He talks about this person that looks in the mirror and, and then forgets it completely what they look like. And I'm sure most of us looked in the mirror within the last 24 hours, probably more than once. And what the mirror does for us, it lets us begin to see everything. We get to see our, our messy hair. We see the zits on our nose. Uh, we get to know what we look like. And I think one of the coolest and amazing things I remember as being a father is when my kids saw their reflection the first time and realized it wasn't somebody else. They understood that that was them. That was their identity. And that took practice. And, and our identity, our, the heart of our practice, when we practice our faith, when we look at the mirror, is to see Jesus. Not just study and walk away, but look and ponder. And what do we see when we look in the mirror? Do we see a stranger? I've been there. Have you seen an enemy? Been there too? Do you see your true self? Yeah. Do you begin to look in the mirror and, and pray to God, let me see your image right here? <clears throat> when we are... When we willfully disregard our reflection and walk into the world, we begin to allow culture to define us. Yet James is saying, don't do that. I know you're locked in culture, but look in the mirror. You are made in the image of the living God. And look into that intently because God is forming you as a member of his family, as his child. And it takes practice and it takes practicing his ways. And, and they be, soon God's ways become our ways and the will is written into our heart like we talked this morning, you know. Romero is saying, God's will, God's will, God's will. Amen. God's will be done in our hearts. And it begins to shape our identity. And, and the more we know ourselves in God, we become freer. And we continue in that freedom that comes in Christ that he died for us. And we become more like him. And it takes practice. And it takes practice. And it takes practice. And it takes practice from doing. And then James concludes that... <clears throat> with the example of how we are to live out the word of God by tying together this, this lesson of being quick to listen and, and practicing what we have received. Um, you know, I, I assembled a desk of furniture, and, and when I was done, I, I put it to life. Like I mentioned, I, I began to write sermons on it. I began to take notes on it. I began to use it every day, and pretty soon it was like that desk 
had been there my whole life. And I didn't, I wouldn't know what I'd do without this desk that, that I assembled. And it's the same with God's word. The, the first is to tend to the most, or the same with God's word. As we begin to go ahead and practice God's word, all of a sudden we, we, we think like, how did I ever live without it? And then James gives a very practical application of God's word. If you want to know the will of God, it's right here. And God says, first, tend to the most vulnerable in your society. And second, is complementary to the first, by being vigilant of ridding yourselves of all that would hinder, pollute, contaminate, or distort God's love and actions in our lives. We cannot extend God's love to others until we have opened up ourselves to receive God's love. And it began, we began this morning with a statement of holiness. Holiness is God's love acting into the love of God. And God's word is to lead us in the fullness of life as we receive it. You know, <clears throat> James says that we are to tend to the orphans and the widows who are faceless and helpless and, and cast, off, cast off in society at the time of Jesus and James. That hasn't changed. That's pro-life, folks. Tending to the most vulnerable in our society and living with them, not just talking about it, but doing it. Seeking people out and walking in their muck with God's love. That's God's holiness. That's God's love living into God's love. And as a community, we are to hear and be practitioners of God's word that's implanted into us that the world may know a difference of hope and love and peace. And our response is to be horizontal in our relationship with others and that relationship that we have as others is a direct relationship with how well we are with our relationship vertically with God and how his word has been implanted with us. So our challenge this week is to have conversations with two different people. Not two conversations with one person, but you can do that. But have two different conversations with, or two conversations with two people. How are our actions a reflection of our faith during the week? That's more complicated than you think. And so with that, would you please stand to receive a blessing? May God bless you and keep you. May you hear, receive, and live out the word of God as we live together as his body. May you remember you are more than yourselves and that you are ambassadors of God. So go out into your community and do well. You are sent. Amen. Amen. And so hold on real quick. We're going to pray for the potluck food because I know everybody's going to jam in there real quick. And we want to go ahead and give, ask God for before we eat. Heavenly Father, thank you for um, your graciousness. Thank you for the food that we're about to receive. We ask that you bless it to the nourishment of our bodies. We ask that you bless the hands that, that touch this food along the way as we sit down and enjoy. Join us in our fellowship as we talk about you, talk about life, and walk together. And we do so to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.